I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Years ago, I was trained in the social, not the psychological sciences, so that my approach to our topic, psychiatry today, and to the distinguished doctors of the mind, who are my guests, is of course of necessity, cautious and perhaps hesitant. Surely I wouldn't play games, though in a sense, the games people play do constitute our subject. So it isn't really in a light vein that I point out that we often gain some perspective concerning the basic questions that plague us by examining first what various responsible persons offer as answers to those questions. Today then, in all seriousness, I suggest that we might gain the most useful insights into and understanding of the psychiatric problems that face contemporary America if first we identify the psychiatric solutions offered by some of the profession's most highly respected investigators and practitioners. And now I'd like to introduce three of those investigators. First, Dr. Nathan S. Klein, Director of Research at Rockland State Hospital in New York, pioneer in psychopharmacology and author most recently of From Sad to Glad, Klein on Depression, published by Putnam. Secondly, Dr. Hyman Spotnitz, neurologist and psychiatrist, widely hailed as a formulator and teacher of group techniques and principles, author of The Couch and the Circle, published by Knopf, and author, too, of my Modern Psychoanalysis of the Schizophrenic Patient. And our third guest, Dr. Daniel Casriel, psychiatric director of the Casriel Institute of Group Dynamics, author of A Scream Away from Happiness, published by Grosset and Dunlop, past president of the American Society of Psychoanalytic Physicians. Now, gentlemen, let me get back to this question of asking, um, uh, to get at the questions, uh, asking what the solutions are, because I have a suspicion from reading your various volumes and uh, knowing a little bit about the psychiatric background of the panel today, that in a sense you approach the problems from a uh, somewhat different point of view. And Dr. Klein, I'd like to begin today uh, in terms of your book, From Sad to Glad, asking you where you identify the, uh, the problem, psychiatric problems of our time through your approach to psychiatric solutions. Well, I think the, one has to distinguish between the psychiatric problems of the individual and the psychological problems in which a society may find itself. Uh, the kinds of patients with whom I deal are individuals who suffer from emotional or mental disturbances to the extent that they either suffer great pain or they're non-functional, their productive capacity is interfered with. And I think that uh, some people are born with uh, a genetic mechanism, a physiology, which, uh, as in other diseases, is more subject than that of some other people. And society, the way they're brought up, uh, what they do may have some effect on making it manifest or not. In some individuals, their depression, their other type of psychiatric illness is going to appear regardless of what they do. In other cases, it depends on what happens to them very much. So society does play a role, but one must have a predisposition to some of these disorders, which, uh, to finish it off, is actually rather hopeful because if this is underlying it, if one can correct this physiological or biochemical disposition or compensate for it, then one has a means of treating the disorder. Well, gentlemen, uh, Dr. Klein has begun speaking about the physiological disposition. Uh, I, I don't assume that anyone is going to challenge it, but perhaps there are different approaches that, that you take. And from sad to glad, he does put his emphasis there. And uh, I wonder where you put yours, Dr. Spotnitz. Well, I would agree with what Dr. Klein has said, that there is a genetic factor involved in mental illness. Uh, there is a constitutional factor. and an experiential factor and in different conditions uh, to, a, to a, a different extent. Uh, each one of these factors plays a major or minor role. So that one has to make a careful diagnosis in each case to find out to what extent are we dealing with primary genetic illness, to what extent we're dealing primarily with constitutional illness, and to what extent are we dealing primarily with experiential illness? And uh, the areas in which uh, chemotherapy is most effective is in the areas where it's primarily genetic and constitutional, and the area in which psychotherapy is most effective is the area where it's primarily uh, experiential. 
Do you feel that uh, the boundaries between those two areas are properly defined uh, these days? Or do you feel that there is a movement uh, toward the, uh, the chemical approach, the psychopharmaceutical uh, psychopharmaceutical approach that's inappropriate? Uh, no, I'm very much in favor of uh, the psychopharmacological uh, approach to the extent which is effective. Uh, the trouble with that approach is that it's a very crude approach. We have a very limited number of drugs. If you compare with the number of drugs you can use in emotional and mental illnesses with the number of words that can be used to influence a person, you see that there's a there's a wide disparity. You can use millions of words and thousands of different communications to influence people, whereas when it comes to the chemical approach, there are a limited number. But the big advantage of the chemical approach is it's very effective and ha has immediate results, uh, whereas the psychotherapeutic approach, the verbal communication, group therapy, or individual therapy, that usually takes much longer, and uh, it's not so easy to make a diagnosis, not so easy to evaluate what's happened, and the results are not necessarily as clear-cut as you get with a, with a drug, drug approach. Dr. Kasmer? Well, certainly there is such a thing as physiological mental disease. Uh, but I basically deal with the psychological problems, the severe behavior disorders. Uh, people who have been brought up in a certain structure, in a certain condition, will develop patterns of behavior according to that condition. And it is up to psychologists, psychiatrists, to restructure the maladaptive people who've been brought up in, in uh, substandard human conditions. Uh, I've developed techniques that are not psychological per se, and they're not uh, physiological per se. They're someplace in between. They're emotional. And I deal with the emotions directly. Emotions that uh, are uh, not purely psychological, not purely physiological. They lie in between. They have a psychological component, they have a physiological component. And I find dealing with those feelings directly can change human behavior, attitudes, and feelings. You gentlemen share that notion of something in between the psychological and the, and the physical? Well, uh, I think it's just a matter of formulation. I think we agree in principle because actually uh, emotion is uh, primarily, uh, one, to a certain extent, hormonal, to a certain extent, physiological, to a certain extent, psychological. And uh, there are different areas of the brain that are involved in emotions and different areas involved in intellectual functioning and different areas involved in purely ner nervous functioning. So that uh, when he, and Dr. Casriel mentions as a, this borderline area, uh, between physiology and uh, straight psychology, intellectual communication, talking about the emotional area. And that's a very important area and a very important area to approach. And it can be approached through emotion, emotional communication. It also can be approached through uh, uh, drugs. It also can be approached through intellectual practice. But the most effective approach known today to emotions is through emotional communication. I would agree with him on that. Dr. Klein, uh, you started by talking about the uh, psychopharmacological approach, and you, you said it was an optimistic mm -hmm. approach. If the notion of a, a high degree of uh, psychological or psychiatric difficulty due to emotional uh, uh, disposition, uh, chemical disposition is, is to be accepted, it's much more optimistic. Uh, do you think that's true in terms of what Dr. Casriel is saying, taking this emotional area, why is the chemical approach more, more optimistic? Well, I think for two reasons. First, let me distinguish between the fact that part of my life is spent as a researcher up at Rockland with a staff of about 250 people and a budget of about four million a year, where we spend a great deal of time trying to investigate the causes and the develop new types of treatment and to relate the, these to the patients that we have. The other part of my life has been in treatment <clears throat> and here in Manhattan. And I think the, the reason that the psychopharmacological approach for many reasons is uh, at least the most practical is that uh, if, let's take depression as one condition, as a rule, if someone is depressed and they're given medication, it takes about three weeks before uh, the, you begin to see some improvement. If you've been unfortunate and for one or another reason selected the wrong medication, it may take another three weeks. But we're talking in terms of 
three weeks to a month or two months at the outside before you begin seeing improvement. And I would certainly agree that the treatment does not uh, cover all cases, but in the area of depression, it's probably somewhere around 80, 85 percent of patients do respond. Uh, if they do respond, the treatment is not only more rapid, uh, it's certainly less traumatic, and anyone who's undergone psychotherapy knows that it's uh, a rather arduous process as a rule. Uh, so it's rapid, uh, it's less painful to undergo, and it's certainly much cheaper than uh, other types of treatment. So that there is actually a, a kind of primacy. If you're in doubt at all, then certainly it is reasonable to try a medical approach, that is using medication. If it doesn't work, uh, then one has to consider other things. There really is no antagonism between the two approaches. I think that in a way to, there's a temptation on the part of many people to try to pit those who are psychotherapists uh, or practice psychotherapy against those who uh, where the stress is on uh, physiological or pharmacological factors. Uh, as you know, I was trained as a psychotherapist and had Paul Schilder, who was one of the great psychotherapists himself, as my teacher, so that there certainly is no antagonism between the two. It's a question of when do you apply one, when do you apply the other, and very often uh, the two treatments can be very successfully combined. Yes, but Dr. Klein, uh, we've known each other for, for, good, for a good many years, and 20 years ago when we sat at a round table like this on a program called The Open Mind, uh, I wasn't pitting a, uh, a more orthodox psychoanalytic approach against your own. I found it there in the person oh, yeah. of someone who was appalled at your uh, psychopharmacological approach. What's happened to that division? Uh, I didn't create it then. I didn't pit one person against the other. Is, is that all disappeared? Uh, Not is entirely. the agreement that exists at this table uh, really all pervasive? Well, uh, I too deal with depression, but on a purely physiological, emotional approach. As a matter of fact, to me, depression isn't a feeling, it's a, it's a symptom of a feeling. The underlying feeling is either pain, really emotional pain, or the inability to express, usually, anger. And uh, I have techniques to get to this feeling of pain immediately, within the first group in most cases, or anger within the first group in most cases. And uh, their depression lifts right then and there. Now, it doesn't stay lifted because many of the attitudes which cause the depression in the first place has to be restructured. But the first thing a person feels when they get down to their feelings is they feel better. Their depression lifts right then and there. Uh, frequently, it stays lifted. Frequently, it'll tend to come back because the attitudes, for instance, if a person feels, thinks, I'm not lovable or I'm not good enough, that's pretty depressing. And they'll walk around feeling depressed. I can remove that depression, they'll feel better, but I have to restructure their thinking which gave rise to the depression. Their depression to me is a symptom, it's telling me something is wrong, it's not a sickness, any more than if a person says, I haven't eaten in three days, and I'm hungry, to me that hunger is not a sickness, it's telling me something. And I treat, why are, haven't they been eating in three days? Uh, or I give them food. In this case, I find out why are they depressed. Uh, the first thing I do is remove the depression, and the second thing is start to look for the reasons that they had these pathological attitudes which gave rise to the depression. And you don't make the connection between the, what you call the pathological, pathological attitudes and an uh, imbalance of the uh, chemistry? There, the there are people, there are definitely people who have an imbalance of chemistry which causes an apathy in the depression. Uh, there are some people that are obviously organic uh, Dr. Klein's patients. Uh, there is uh, another group that are obviously my type of patient. And there is a group in between that I don't know. I try it my way, and if they don't respond right away, I'll send them to uh, a doctor that deals on a, uh, uh, with medication, or occasionally I'll give them some medication myself to see if it, if it covers, uh, carries them over. Is that the end of the road? No, that's only the beginning of the road. Uh, uh, they then have to restructure all their thinking about themselves, which gave rise to depression. For instance, I find that most people are depressed because they're basically not getting their emotional needs met. Uh, as adults, we can meet all of our needs. We can feed ourselves, we can clothe ourselves, we can support ourselves. We can even masturbate uh, for sexual relief. But there's one thing I feel we need another human being for, and that's the feeling of emotional closeness, what I call bonding. 
The feeling of warmth and closeness and sharing intimate, tender, open, honest feelings. If we don't have that, we're going to get, quote, depressed. And uh, what I do is find out why a person hasn't been able to reach out and feel close to somebody. Uh, they usually don't feel good enough, or they don't feel lovable, or they feel the price is too great, or they feel uh, uh, they're doing something wrong, or they're guilty. There's a million different pathological attitudes that prevent a person from getting their emotional needs met from other significant human beings. And uh, what I do is, uh, is to deal with those pathological attitudes, not intellectually per se, but emotionally first, and then talk about it intellectually. But you seem not very much to make the connection, or at least not very often, between those attitudes and this chemical imbalance no, that Dr. Klein has uh, concerned himself with. No, well, of course, uh, our patients are almost pre-selected. Uh, the patients that see Dr. Klein see Dr. Klein for various reasons. The patients that come to me are usually referred from other, by other patients. They've seen the change in other patients. And usually there are birds of a feather flock together. So I might be getting a type of pre-selected patient. I very rarely see the organic depression. But there are, there, such a thing does exist, the involutional depressive. Uh, however, I've seen changes even in those on an emotional level. I think the, the thing that makes it very difficult is that if an individual is depressed, and uh, as I mentioned to you, my concern is more with treatment and, uh, as a practitioner than it is with the, uh, the research, which is a separate part of my existence. But <clears throat> the symptoms which Dr. Caswell describes are very much the symptoms that an individual who has a depression on a physiological, biochemical basis has. <clears throat> and I think the problem arises to know whether it's the cart or the horse that's going first. Uh, because if an individual has a depression on a physiological or biochemical basis, the, the most common symptom uh, is, interestingly enough, not depression, but as I bring out in the book, the, the, the lack of joy and pleasure in existence, to which I think all of us are not only entitled, but would come to naturally. And it was Hamlet who put it very nicely when he said, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to be all the uses of this world. He doesn't say he's depressed. He just says that everything is blah. He's, he's not interested. He has no pleasure in things. But <clears throat> this can arise on a, on a physiological basis as well. It may, since I only see rarely many of Dr. Casreal's you know, patients, as I'm sure he sees some of mine, since the we tend to see the failures of uh, yes, yes. each other's failures rather than each other's successes. But uh, the, the, the point is that uh, there's a great difficulty sometimes in distinguishing. We do not yet have adequate uh, uh, biochemical blood tests in order to distinguish uh, who belongs to Dr. Casriel, who belongs to Dr. Spotnitz, and who belongs to me. Well, Gaul may have been divided into three parts, uh, and you gentlemen seem to feel that uh, there isn't any basic uh, conflict here. You, you have your individual categories of patients with whom you deal. Would it be fair, though, to say that less sophisticated people, including myself, of course, but that by and large, less sophisticated people do see a split between and among the approaches that you take, and for that reason, that split, that presumed split, becomes what is current in the minds of most other people and that uh, your polite assumption that you have three valid approaches uh, to different kinds of patients or for different reasons um, kind of bypasses what seems to be an increasing conflict between those who want uh, the immediate relief that, um, uh, that you suggest, Dr. Klein, uh, those who take much longer uh, those modalities of treatment that takes much longer. And I would ask Dr. Spotnitz, with what result? What's the difference? What's the, what's the bottom line uh, difference between the, the person who experiences something other than uh, chemical treatment? See, this, this uh, tendency to see a split here can be a very severe handicap in the field. Uh, there, as Dr. Casriel said, there are certain patients that will, uh, will respond uh, primarily to his approach. As Dr. Klein said, there are certain patients that respond to his approach. 
and I've had the experience with both types of patients, but I also want to present another type of patient, which responds to the combined approach. And if you have the split, then you're in trouble. See, the patient that I, I once had, who was an amazing man, very depressed, suicidal, I treated him a couple of years, and then he told me uh, that he was going to have to commit suicide. He didn't believe that there was any way out of this feeling of terrible depression, lack of joy of living. Life meant nothing to him. His father committed suicide. Now he had to do it. Well, I sent him to a specialist in Dr. Klein's field who gave him a drug for one week, and the depression disappeared. He said, I'm never going to have to be depressed again. And he continued treatment for a short time afterwards. And he, as far as I know, this is 10 years later, he's a cured man, never had another depression, was functioning very well in the, in the field of uh, his profession. You say a cured man. What do you mean by that? I mean, he never had, he, as far as is known, he never had another depression of any significance. I mean, he has temporary feelings of unhappiness and so on. But the danger of suicide has completely disappeared in this man's life, and the danger and his inability to function has disappeared. He holds a highly respectable position in life and does the work he wants to do very successfully. But if one would separate the field out and say, certain patients are only use drugs, certain patients you only use a psychotherapeutic approach, then this type of patient couldn't be helped because he needed the combined approach to really make him into a well-functioning person. I think this area of uh, psychotherapeutic influence and pharmacological influence needs very careful study and investigation because we don't know which patient will only respond to the pharmacological approach, which one will only respond to the other, which patient needs the combined approach. But if we are open to all three approaches, but that's why I favor this program, the open mind. If we have an open mind, and then we are available for all these approaches, then we can pick out the approach which is specific for that patient's needs. But if we make a real split, uh, then we aren't necessarily going to be able to help the patient who needs the combined approach. Is there, is there a difference, perhaps, uh, nevertheless, in your assumption about uh, what your objectives are with a uh, patient, and perhaps Dr. Klein's, uh, are you going to be satisfied with that immediate relief? He comes in in three weeks or eight weeks or ten weeks, uh, he has relief and he moves on. Uh, is this what you would accept too? As you No, I wouldn't be satisfied with that, but I don't work with patients for my own satisfaction. So I work primarily for the patient's satisfaction. If a patient says he wants immediate relief and he wants immediate relief with drugs, it seems to me he's entitled to that. The patient wants personality change, Dr. Kazri was mentioning, complete change of intellect and personality, he's entitled to that. Depends on what the individual wants, and it depends on what he wants is good for him. Well, I agree with him. I'm willing to help him get the approach which is most effective and most meets his needs. The big disadvantage of the pharmacological approach is the person may remain dependent on that. Uh, the primary goal of a psychotherapy approach is to make the person eventually totally independent of drugs and the psychotherapist. I think, yeah, I think I think what you're no, I think well, let me first of all the drugs are, are do not create dependence as they in the Dr. Sputnitz is using it in a somewhat different sense as I'm sure he'll agree that as compared with heroin or amphetamines, we're not talking about that. Uh, the the drugs which are used in treatment do not produce addiction or drug dependence in the usual sense. And I think what Dr. Spotnitz raises as a point is that the individual, should there be a recurrence, uh, would obviously turn to the, the, the more rapid treatment. I think what you're trying to get at is to stir up uh, the question of whether Dr. Spotnitz and uh, possibly Dr. Kazril get at the causes of things and therefore obviate uh, the possibility of recurrence, whereas, uh, as has been accused, I stress the relief of symptoms. Uh, there was a, a French surgeon, Paré, who lived in the 16th century, and he made a great statement. He said, I treat and God cures. And in a sense, no physician ever cured any patient of anything. All that the physician can do is to maximize the possibilities of self-healing. And I think this is what Paré meant, and it's just as true today. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, Dr. Spotnitz and Dr. Casriel do it in terms of uh, dealing with either psychotherapy, with the mind, or with the emotions. Uh, the approach which uh, uh, we do primarily is in terms of the biochemistry. There are patients whom we also refer for psychotherapists. We, uh, we have two very good psych psychologists working with us, so that it's not that we look down or uh, reject this type of treatment. But psychotherapy, uh, we don't know any more really about 
uh, how psychotherapy works and we know how pharmacotherapy works. The, the objectives of the psychotherapist is the same objectives as we have, and that is relief of the pain and suffering and increasing the individual's uh, productive participation in what's going on. Dr. So, Kaiser, no, I, I, think I, I think I slightly disagree. Uh, our first disagree. I think my previous goal was getting a patient from sick to well, but that's no longer my goal. Uh, I find as, uh, that most of the people that come to me are not sick, they're malprogrammed, they're maladapted, they're unhappy. And I've changed my goal from sick to well, to unhappy to happy. Now I found out that most of my psychotherapeutic uh, endeavor is not getting a person from sick to well, that's easy. The, the hard part is getting a person from well to happy. Everybody feels entitled to take their hand away from a burning stove if it p pains them. Nobody has any problems about trying to remove pain. But it's amazing the conflicts and the distortions that people have when you say, reach out for happiness. You know, don't settle for a lack of pleasure. Don't settle for just being well. You should be able to feel a sense of well-being and, and a joie de vie about yourself. Not all the time, but the capacity to feel it when it's appropriate, to really feel good about life. And that's a different state than just well. That's a state of well-being and happy. And people feel, have a lot of problems about reaching out for pleasure. They don't trust it, it's hedonistic, it's immoral, it's unethical, it's, you know, what do you mean happy? Like, uh, I'll settle for God shouldn't strike me down and I should be well. Well, that's not enough. That's not enough as far as I'm concerned. But I agree with Dr. Spotnik, you can't tell every patient to what, what is enough. To what I have is not so much a medical process, but an educational process. And like every educational process, some people say, well, I graduate from grammar school, that's well and that's enough. Some people want high school, some people want to go a, a higher step to college or graduate school. Amazingly, the people that come to me who have higher educational levels stay the longest. Not that they're the sickest, but they have a higher capacity and they want a greater amount of pleasure out of life. So the people that stay the year or more are the people with their, uh, basically the professional, the people with more than a college education. Um, you know, it, it interests me that uh, you are using some of the, you and Dr. Klein use the same words here, and I think Dr. Spotnitz did too. Uh, Dr. Klein calls his book From Sad to Glad. You say, never mind the business from sick to well. The person's happy. Uh, that's an interesting development, and I think it is a development. You may totally approve of it, as you, as you seem to. But is our objective uh, the production of uh, sad to glad people, happy people, or is there some larger framework? You call it moral, call it anything you want, call it social in which our concern is for well people who may not at all moments have smiles on their faces, may not say, uh, uh, I'm happy, I'm glad rather than sad, but who fit into a pattern of what we consider an appropriate relationship to society at large. The, the emphasis upon glad rather than sad, happy, uh, as you suggest, isn't this, isn't this mark a change in our attitudes toward uh, uh, the well-being of society, where we now put our emphasis upon the well-being of, uh, of individuals only. We produce happy people. That's what you seem to want. Yeah, well, that's great. And, you know, they're not, pro they're not non-productive. They're very productive people. They're very socially productive. Give me a group of happy people, and I'll show you a very productive group of people. Well, what about those people who were swallowing all that summer in Brave New World? Uh, happy people, I presume. They weren't sad. They seemed to have been glad. Uh, I think you're hitting on an area where we most disagree. Well, go ahead. Go ahead please. <laughs> I think that the objectives that we all have, we disagree, we disagree on. For instance, I'm not interested in making people happy at all. See? When I work with people, I want to help them become mature personalities. I want them to be able to function at their maximum capacity. I think he may want to make them happy. He may want to remove some symptoms or have some different objective. We all have different objectives, but none of us insist that the patients go where we want them to go. And Dr. Casual described it very well. Some patients only want to graduate from grammar school, some high school, some college graduate school. So we take them to different stages of emotional development and maturity. But uh, I, I, when I work with a patient, I want to help them become 
the best kind of person he can be from his own point of view and function in the best way he can function. Now, this may take me 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, or even longer. So uh, uh, that's, that, that's the price one has to pay for a, a very deep emotional education. But uh, some doctors are not, not interested in that type of work. So the patient who wants to get a brief education and brief change has to pick out the kind of doctor who will provide that. The patient who wants to have a longer education should go to the one who wants to give them a longer education. But it doesn't mean that we, uh, any one of us is doing any better work or any worse work. It just means that we have different objectives and that uh, we have to evaluate eventually which patient should go to which doctor for which objective. As, as a layperson, of course, I've always assumed that the objective of a uh, physician was to heal his patient. Now you seem all to be telling me it's not to heal a patient, it is to give him what he wants. He wants to be glad, we make him glad. He wants to feel better, we help him feel I better. I said that. I thought that's what you said. No, I mean, the, the, the point is that I think that people have a capacity, if they're feeling well, to get some enjoyment out of life. Uh, the other two doctors have also stressed the fact that anybody who goes around happy all the time is sick. I mean, this is not a normal state of affairs. The world Send it back to Dr. Klein again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if they're too happy, that, that, yeah. it's no joke. The manic patient uh, uh, the, is so euphoric that he gets into all kinds of trouble. They're, uh, they're very unrealistic because the world is not that uh, happy a place. But <clears throat> I think people have a normal capacity for enjoying at least part of what they're doing. If you eliminate the, the sadness and the anxiety, you're eliminating a lot of the the things that, uh, that all of us value, a uh, great part of the world's literature, art, music is based on the capacity to feel so and, and to suffer. So I don't think any of us are advocating that. <clears throat> but th the point possibly wherein we differ is I feel that, one, that individuals have this tendency to self-healing if you remove the impediments. Now, uh, in the kinds of patients I treat are the ones who uh, hopefully are the ones where it can be removed by biochemical means. Once it's removed, very often these patients go on spontaneously and, in a sense, cure themselves, as uh, any patient has to do, regardless of what he's being treated for. So that, that part of it is, is, is no great disagreement, I think. But and the other thing is, in terms of even maturation, I think there are people who would go to someone like Dr. Spotnitz who have the need for a, a very interesting kind of, uh, of maturation, which is different from the usual, and who have the need and who benefit from such a relationship. In general, as you know, we've discussed this in other areas, uh, I'm uh, more for allowing people to develop spontaneously. Sometimes they develop in ways you don't like, but uh, that's another problem. I think that individuals should be given the opportunity, <clears throat> unless they have a need and, and wish it, to go ahead and develop how they choose to. In other words, no censorship of, uh, uh, unless obviously they're going to become engaged in criminal activities or they're going to cause suffering to someone else or undo suffering. We all cause other people's suffering. This is unfortunately part of, the, the, of our fate. You know, we're going to do a program on the open mind sometime in the near future on the legal establishment and on the degree to which perhaps lawyers become today less and less officers of the court and of some assumption about legality and appropriate legal behavior and more and more extensions of their clients. Our client wants to do this, that's his business, we'll, we'll do it. And that's why I raise the question about healing as opposed in, to, to, in a simple way to me uh, to the matter of uh, from sadness to, to gladness. Uh, I, I didn't mean to pose myself as one who would, would say this is a, it's a shocking shift in, in medical ethics. In fact, it seems to me that what has been happening here, let's say in the 20 years, Dr. Klein, since we first discussed this subject uh, with a um, psychoanalytically oriented psychiatrist who was appalled at what you were doing, um, I suppose it would be more difficult today to find such a sense of total shock and total rejection. Mm -hmm. There'd be some shock and some oh, yeah. rejection, but not, Hopefully. not quite so, so totally. Isn't that a response to the notion that um, what you gentlemen are doing with groups, uh, with chemistry, uh, is in response to a greater and greater felt need, a greater and greater demand on the part of more and more people which can't be met with more traditional 
or through more traditional uh, methods. And now the need comes to uh, develop non-traditional methods and to rationalize them. I don't mean explain them away, but develop a, uh, a philosophy uh, for them. And I wonder whether you're not simply responding to the fact that there are so many, 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 many more people crying. No, I don't, I don't think uh, that is certainly not my response. I think I found a better way to do it, the, uh, the process. Uh, I'm not apologizing for my way in terms of, well, we got so many, we have to dilute the, the gold of analysis. I think the process that uh, people are developing of giving somebody a pill to uh, to make them compensate their brain compensation is not an apology to psychoanalysis as a as a uh, uh, because we don't have the time to analyze them. I think it's a better and a new way, and I think uh, the past 20 years has really uh, seen a revolution in psychiatry in terms of drugs. I think we're about to see a revolution in terms of psychiatry, in terms of psychological treatments. Uh, because I think we are finding better and better ways and quicker and quicker ways to, uh, to treat the uh, problem or to re-educate the problem. And one thing I wanted to, uh, I don't overlook the growth, the mat maturation of the personality. You can't be a happy adult person without being in a happy, without being an adult person, right. mature and, and responsible. <laughs> and certainly a lot of the people that I treat in my residential facility, Ariba, are severe behavior and character disorders, drug addicts and kids who've been in their room for seven years, or a compulsion of washing their bodies with scabs. And these people, I found out, were not organically a uh, problem, but psychologically extremely disturbed, extremely disturbed. And we are able to re-educate them emotionally, behaviorally, and attitudinally, so they come out a fairly healthy human being, not in years, but in 5, 10, 15, 20 months. Uh, and I think what we have to take into consideration is that uh, the trend in the field of psychiatry is toward greater specificity. See, originally, uh, there was the idea that uh, there was only one approach of my work, which was a psychoanalytic approach. But as the years have gone by, the psychoanalytic approach has been covered to be effective only for certain patients. The psychopharmacological approach is only effective for certain patients. The, uh, the emotional approach is effective for certain patients. We have to make a careful diagnosis as the years go by and we're going to see in the future many different conditions in my own experience every individual turns out to really be an individual he doesn't respond to any routine approach even the psychopharmacology where you think you can just give anybody any drug you have to match the drug to the patient and when it comes to emotional approach you're going to have to match the feelings for the patient same with the analytic approach so we're going to see many new techniques develop many new methods many new drugs going to be on the horizon my anticipation is that we're going to see more and more specific interventions for specific patients. With the same objective? Yes. The objective, objective that you... Uh, yeah, we were all, I think we're all aim, all psychiatry is aiming eventually at helping people attain their maximum emotional potential as a human being. Yeah. One of the interesting things is, in, in, in a way, my area, of my approach is the least controversial rather than the most because the Food and Drug Administration requires that before a new drug is put on the market, that one must compare it either with a placebo, that is a blank, or with a standard drug which is already on the market. So that any kind of therapy which I give is subject to very rigid uh, examination and uh, scientific requirements. Uh, in a sense, the, the uh, psychotherapy I've often wondered why the Food and Drug Administration doesn't subject psychotherapy to these same criteria and uh, make the, uh, the therapist demonstrate that what he's doing uh, uh, is superior to doing nothing or is superior to standard treatment. Uh, it's, it's a wild, uh, maybe not so wild fantasy, but I think this would help clarify which patients would do well with which kinds of treatment. I can only tell you that among the patients that we see, which, as Dr. Spotnitz points out, which medication is likely to work best on which type of patient. Uh, how one determines, since the psychotherapists don't set up uh, these uh, double-blind experiments or trials, how one would know which, uh, uh, which type of psychotherapy would be most useful. We do it by clinical means, obviously. Uh, you have an in there are patients, I'm sure, that Dr. Spotnitz n knows intuitively that he, uh, he wouldn't handle. He mentioned one that he referred uh, uh, for pharmacotherapy, and Dr. Kazriel points out he's more interested, in a sense, to take the patient from being well to being happy. 
whereas my concern is with the individual who has depression or has what's called anhedonia, lack of joy and pleasure, can't concentrate, uh, insomnia, uh, underachievement, who ruminates about the past and all the things he didn't do that he should have done and all the things he did do that he shouldn't have done, so on. So that, in a way, we're, uh, uh, it's true, the, we're, we're, we're treating a different group, which makes it, uh, in a sense, very difficult for us to argue with each other because it, we're, we're t treating different kinds of individuals under different conditions in different ways which, uh, as far as I can tell, is uh, uh, now, I think, compared with 20 years ago, a generally accepted approach to the field. I, I certainly can't disagree with you three gentlemen, because you're <laughs> saying what you do. I do have a sense, as I read uh, what each of you has published, that somewhere there is that sense of, uh, not quite here it is, to the exclusion of anything else. I, I, I don't mean that, and I'm not trying to say, let's you and they fight. Uh, I'm suggesting that, that there does seem to me as a layperson, again, a kind of basic difference in the approach that here there will be more of a resolution of the problems we face um, uh, in this regard. In Dr. Spotnitz's book, The Couch in the Circle, uh, he points out that he uses both, and yet I, I had the feeling as I read that um, there was a kind of sense of joy in the accomplishments of the circle, and uh, Dr. Spotnitz, I was... I was uh, you said here, it would be fascinating to form a group of highly aggressive personalities, top dogs in various fields with conflicting interests, a police chief interacting in a therapy group with a gang leader or an industrial tycoon with the head of a labor union could certainly stir up a great deal of hatred. If they also developed love for each other and learned how to prevent any of their feelings from seriously interfering with their functioning in the sessions, I would know that they were having a therapeutic experience together. This could be the supreme test of the power of group psychotherapy, maybe that test that Dr. Dr. Klein was talking about, I had the feeling that there was a, um, uh, an enormous sense of um, joy on your part in writing about that, that uh, circle rather than the couch, and that you were, if not pushing an approach, obviously, to the exclusion of others. That there is a division, there is a feeling that um, here is a more uh, all in all, by and large, setting aside the individual differences, a more effective uh, modality of treatment. I, I guess you're saying... Well, I wish it were true it. that I could say that, but I really can't. I can't say that group therapy is more effective modality, or that uh, pharmacology is more effective, or that individual approach is more effective. I told you it's specific. The, the individual patient may require sometimes one modality, sometimes another. And we can't say that uh, penicillin is the ideal drug for every condition, or teramycin or any other drug. Uh, the trouble with the field of medicine is we don't have the wonder drug for every disease, <laughs> every disease is different. And not only is every disease different, but every patient is different. So that uh, treatment in the field of medicine and in the field of psychology is an awfully complex process. And it's necessary to really understand the patient, to see how he reacts to whether you're giving him a drug or giving him a psychological um, intervention, and then to determine what is the most effective approach for that individual. And unfortunately, we don't even have the proper diagnostic test today yet. We're still working on that. Yeah, I think he's pointing up the very important. We don't have a diagnostic test that can say, okay, you go here, you go here. I think an ethical practitioner, physician, who has a total spectrum of treatment available, at least either to, in himself or by referral, will probably, if he thinks it's possible, try his approach on the patient. If he sees he's not getting the type of result he expects within the period of time that he allows, he will then refer them to a Dr. Klein or a Dr. Spotnix. Uh, and I think this is really the safeguard of the patient is to go into the hands of a, of a physician who has this open mind and who's willing to say, hey, you know, I think Dr. Klein might do you more good than I can. Yes, but the question that I would raise again is, do you more good? How, what's the bottom line? Is it happiness? Is it, or is it wellness? And I guess keep coming around this circle uh, well, in that way. if I refer them to Dr. Klein, it's not for happiness, it's for wellness. Okay, <laughs> good enough, good enough. I didn't need to imply that. refer them to me for happiness. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're serious. You would yes, rather I, think in those terms. You'd rather be identified as someone who is concerned with happiness well, than wellness. Well, I don't stop at wellness. I mean, I see people who are very depressed and they get well. I like them to then go on 
to be happy. You mean the first is wellness and the yes. second one is it's the happiness. second step is happiness? I see a lot of patients that would never see Dr. Klein. In other words, they come in, they say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sick. I'm not depressed. I'm not anxious. I just don't feel that I'm getting enough out of life. You know, I got a good business, I got a, ma a wife that loves me, I'm okay, the kids are okay, but I'm bored, there must be something more. I've taken up golf, I've done this, and you know, there's something missing. Can you help me find out what it is? I mean, there's really this other thing, if you are well, whatever in the world that means, still there is this other thing that uh, well you may be, but uh, now we'll try to get some happiness for you. Yes, you know, a, a beggar on the streets of Calcutta with a loaf of bread under his hand, and you say, are you well? He'll look at you and say, well, I'm not only well, I'm happy. I got a loaf of bread under my hand. That's the most he's ever known about happiness. But would you and I say we're happy if that's how we had to live? So living, you know, can be rather different degrees of pleasure. Some people will settle for being well. And if they want that, fine. I'm not here to say you got to be uh, better than that. I'm not going to take this beggar off the street at Calcutta and say, you don't know what you're missing, come to New York. Or, or better still, you know, go to a nice, beautiful climate. Uh, uh, I wouldn't do that, but if a person says, I'm functioning, here I am, a, a New Yorker, and, you know, I got the loaf of bread, the equivalent under my hand, and uh, I'm not physically ill, uh, but I'm just not enjoying enough. Well, we are soon going to celebrate the 200th anniversary of that uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but I guess I had always been under the uh, illusion that uh, that happiness really was equated with wellness, that happiness really meant uh, the capacity of a, of a society to permit people to be well, to grow well, uh, to well, start I would well. say, Dick, that anyone who is well is happy at least part of the time. Yeah. Anyone who is not well, and somebody who's well is also sad part of the time, and is anxious part of the time, and is depressed part of the time. But, but happiness, or, or this feeling of euphoria, we, have, we all have it from time to time, if, if we are well. If you don't have it at all, then by, by my criterion, there's something wrong, because I think uh, man is born to, uh, to be happy. I mean, I think this is a, uh, this is a natural state of, uh, of, of the human, at least part of the time, to, to get enjoyment out Dick, of life. I, I want to give you an example of, of this problem, which was very dramatically presented to me by a young man one day. I treated him for about two years for gastric ulcer, and the ulcer disappeared, and he was getting along fine, but he was a stock boy in a major company here in New York City. And he, uh, he had ambitions to be, uh, become president of the company. And he had the intellectual ability and the potential personality to get there. So I said to him, uh, would you like to continue to be, develop your personality and become head of the company? He said, how long would it take? take? I said, it would take several years, possibly if you achieved it. He says, no, thank you. I just came here to get rid of my ulcer. I'm happy to spend the rest of my life as a stock boy. And then he left treatment. Now, he was happy. He didn't, he didn't have to become president of the company. Uh, he subsequently got married. and. Uh, as far as I know, he lives happily every now and I say, I, I, he sends me a patient. But this man had the potential to be of great social value. He didn't want to achieve it. It's not my job to make him get there. If he wants to remain a stock for all his life, that's his, that's, his uh, uh, that's his choice. And I went along with him, helped him with that choice. But uh, as Dr. Casbill said, he could have gone a long way ahead. He could have gone to graduate school, gone ahead and become president. So we don't know. You know, uh, what we should do under those conditions always. But the question wasn't uh, one of success or being well. Would you consider him well? Well, from by, his, by his likes, by his standards, he was well. By my standards, he hadn't, he hadn't achieved his full potential. But he doesn't have to live, live according to my standards, and I wouldn't impose my standards on him. Okay, let me, let me go back to a question that was stirred up by something Dr. Casriel said. He talked before about psychological revolution. He talked about a chemical revolution, and now there's a psychological revolution in warning. What is it? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's a, it's a different approach to, the, to uh, the person who's unhappy or not well. Uh, I'm currently being subsidized by a couple of states to deal with their problemed, uh, adolescents, the kids who've been abandoned, the kids who've been uh, on drugs, the kids who've been in police courts, uh, they, they're now putting them all together. These are the problem children. And many of them have uh, 
uh, have never had any mothering, no loving, no nothing. They, uh, they've just been raised as weeds, human weeds. And uh, they have to be cultivated. They have to be re-educated, uh, re-humanized. Uh, now, I think uh, the previous type of psychiatry would never be able to deal with the drug addict, for instance, the classical one-to-one, -one, three times a week or five times a week. Why? Uh, because it was a very inefficient process. It would be like Dr. Klein giving an aspirin for a schizophrenic. It just wasn't enough. Uh, I found that we, you know, I started the, the therapeutic community movement in this country. I started Daytop about 12 years ago, and now I have Ariba. Uh, and I was the first psychiatrist to take Synanon seriously. I wrote the first book on Synanon. And these people need a totally restructuring, a total re-education, a total new culture, a new family experience to re-educate themselves and to develop their potential. Uh, and that's what we do. Uh, and we do have standards, and we do have goals, and we do have value systems. And when they graduate from Ariba, they, there is a sort of a mark uh, or a stamp on them. They, they look or something similar, as you would if you graduated from, uh, from Harvard or Annapolis, there's a, there's a mark. Uh, within six months or a year, that mark fades out, and you can't tell that they graduated from a Harvard or a Reba. But we do give them standards, just as they did with any educational system. Ours is an educational system. We give them values. We say two and two is four, and that's right. And these are the things that are right. We teach about relationship and responsibility and reality testing and, re and uh, uh, being concerned for others because if you're not, oh, nobody's going to be concerned for you. You say teach. You mean train or teach? Teach, train. That's right. Educate. Teach and train. Let them experience it. And we do this in, with different types of group processes. We have the emotional group that I evolved. We also have attitudinal groups. We have behavioral groups. We have the classical encounter from Synanon and Daytop. Uh, we have educational groups. A whole, it's amazing what they have to learn in terms of sex education. You know, if a boy grows up and he feels that to be a man, he has to have 47 erections and be able to have a woman lie in a pool of sweat and then, you know, shake on the chandelier, that's a man. Well, you know, if he, feel, if he really feels that, you know what he does? He avoids that, he becomes homosexual. Uh, because it's amazing the distortions that people grow up with feeling this is what a man is supposed to be. When you use the phrase psychological revolution, you said it will bring about better and better results, and then you said very quickly, faster and faster. Yes. Um, would it be fair to say that the faster and faster looms uh, particularly large because of the very problems that you're dealing with? Well, it's... Crime, drugs... It's, it's uh, realistic. Uh, it, it takes time to re-educate uh, and re-socialize and re-humanize a, uh, a delinquent uh, who might be shooting dope or shooting at the cops or stealing or whatever. It takes us about a good year, maybe a year and a half. But we'll turn out a pretty healthy human being. And in terms of their functioning, they function better than the average adolescent as a group who's never had the need for therapy. They'll get better grades in school. They'll get the better girlfriends. They'll, they'll live up much closer to their potential. So this is a, is a kind of behavior modification? Well, it, no, it's, it's behavior modification, it's intellectual modification, and it's emotional modification. ARIVA stands for Accelerated Re-Education of Emotions, Behavior, and Attitudes. We re-educate not only the behavior, but the attitudes and the feelings of the individual. Uh, we re-educate them morally, ethically, culturally, socially, vocationally. We have people coming in. Of course, Ariba was originally started for middle and upper class kids who had the best schools and who were illiterate. They were uneducatable in the best schools because they had such emotional blocks. And we remove those blocks and they learn their four years of high school in about a year. Now, if, if I were a uh, pusher of SOMA, if I were uh, uh, concerned about the huge numbers of people, young and old, who are in need of some kind of uh, rehabilitation, mm -hmm. uh, do you think I would find in what you've suggested uh, and in more uh, traditional approaches, seem funny to talk about uh, this is traditional approaches, but the groups, intellectual or emotional, would I find enough satisfaction? Uh, would I find uh, the speed that is necessary to bring about change in our times? Would I find sufficient relief from the giant social problems that are created by I, I uh, think neurotic, I, psychotic persons? I honestly and sincerely feel I have tools now 
to deal on this social level. I think the, some of these tools that I've developed as a physician should much better be applied in the school system. I, I feel that we should add three additional R's to the reading, writing, and arithmetic. Relationship, responsibility, and reality testing. I think we can teach these things from, from kindergarten right on through college. I think it should be part of every school curriculum in the country, every classroom, to teach a person how to, how to uh, be human and, and mature. Are you as sanguine about that approach? Oh. Not only am I saying it, but I'm very much in favor of that approach. I, I've been advocating that for many years myself, but the school system is totally uh, lacking in what it should provide for the children of this country, that uh, providing the intellectual education and not providing for an emotional education is, uh, is a very uh, uh, unhappy approach. I mean, it leads to all kinds of disastrous consequences. I remember one head headmaster of one of the most uh, illustrious schools in the country saying, We'll help your children get into uh, college, but uh, uh, if they have a mental breakdown, it's not our fault. And uh, it's because the schools do not accept responsibility for the emotional education, the reality testing, and the other, other considerations Dr. Casbill said. Children do need uh, a thorough education in every aspect of life, and there is this trend going on to give it to them. And uh, uh, the, the field of psychiatry is our responsibility to provide the uh, tools which should eventually be introduced into the school system so that children can all be helped to become uh, mature people and uh, we really realize their potential. Those are very happy thoughts. Do you think they are possible of realization within the context of the size of the nation we have? Yes, I think it's possible, but I think you're going to find tremendous opposition and that for that reason it's going to take many years to accomplish it. But it certainly is possible to do it. And I suppose because of that opposition and because of the difficulty, we may turn more and more to Dr. Klein and his uh, rather fast Even approaches. opposition to his work, too. No, no. And I, I think <laughs> the problem seconds. is, we don't, unfortunately, we don't really know how to do these things. It would be interesting to subject them to rigorous scientific tests, whether one can produce a sense of responsibility, a sense of reality. It, there, I think we're all for it. It becomes a question of can you accomplish it? Well, and that's what the, the point. cost is, too. And that's the, point at which, that's the point, gentlemen, at which I, I'm sorry to say our program is at an end, but I do want to thank you so much for joining me today. Dr. Nathan S. Klein, Dr. Hyman Spotnitz, and Dr. Daniel Casriel. And thanks, too, to you and our audience. I hope that you'll join us again on The Open Mind. And meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. Well, gentlemen, thank you for... This is Richard Hefner. We would like to know your opinion on today's subject. Write to The Open Mind in care of this station. <laughs>